Dmitry Marinov. <laughs> All right. So tell us, uh, how did you, how did you get here? I mean, what what is your you're a professional musician? Is that correct? Classically trained Classical, violinist. Yes. And that's what you do, for a living? No. No. Okay. But what no. do you, what have you been doing? Tell us a little bit about your. Uh, I started. Okay, first of all, I'm from Bulgaria, as you all know. It's a small little country in the Balkans, famous with three stinky things. Feta cheese, I'm sorry, Greeks, it comes from Bulgaria. <laughs> and um, the roses, it's the biggest valley of roses in the world. And me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have you. Um, yeah. I was an orphan. Um, the sperm donor was Jewish which is kind of odd for Bulgaria to have Orthodox Jew to mess around with the Christian Orthodox woman. <coughs> but during the communism, nobody gives an ass. So they fall in love. Uh, they did it for the first time for both. And here I am. <laughs> and I was adopted at age of four. I was adopted of elder widow at age of four. I start playing violin. By age of 11, I was first chair in the symphony orchestra. Uh, one of those Soviet prodigy and by age of 15, I performed in New York, the Circle Hall, conducted by Leonard Bernstein. Wow. And uh, I play for the Queen of England twice. I play for John Paul II, the Pope, bless his soul, twice. I play with Herbert von Karajan a few times, with Pavarotti a few <coughs> times. I've been all over the world. I've been three times to North Korea. Wow. Uh, I've been twice to Cuba. And actually, I have two pictures with Fidel. One of them is my favorite, which my mom keeps in her bedroom. <laughs> when I'm the first chair violinist, I was only 14, and the first cello girl. So he gives her this big hug, and you can see her, you can see him, but you don't see me. <laughs> because the smoke of his cigar is right in front of my face. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. <laughs> And then uh, by age of 16, I was invited to a local theater to play violin. For, I'm part of this play, and I'm the son of this family. And I have two scenes, one line, but playing two tunes. And this was the time when I walked on that stage. I've been in many stages as a classical musician, but theater stage, as you know, is different. <coughs> so I walked in, and something happened at that very moment. It's just something happened inside. I even forgot my line. I didn't want to get out. I didn't want to leave. I start playing with some kind of toy, and then I hear from the sides, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I love it here. <laughs> so, and that's where my heart flipped. And make the long story short, I start spending my lunch money for acting classes. My mother had no clue. Then I start opera singing classes. My mother had no clue. Ballroom dancing, which I think it's very important for an actor. My mother had no clue. And after two years, I was accepted first in the Master Academy of Bulgaria for Theater and Film. My mother knew that I'm accepted at the conservatory. <laughs> And she passed away, never knowing that I was an actor. And um, every time she see me on TV or somewhere, she thinks it's some kind of hobby of mine. And most of the time, I try to come out the first thing on TV with the violin, so she thinks, <laughs> even though I don't play it. But it was this time of my life. And then 18 years old, before I started the academy, a uh, communist country, mandatory, we have to go in the army. I was in the Red Army, and uh, by age of 19, I was uh, accused of propaganda of all my fellow soldiers about the West. I've been to America, I've been to all over the world, and I was arrested by the KGB. 40 days, still marks on my back, and after that, the tribunal, Two years, six months, and ten days political prison. And the cream of my career, I mean my youth. I came out, um, all my rights were demolished by the communist 
government and I, nobody will give me a job because I am now the enemy of the state. We're talking 1986. <clears throat> and then the only place I found work so I can provide for my mom and I, because she was at the time almost 70 some years old, a theater hired me as a night cleaning guy. <laughs> After the show is over, I clean the stage, I clean the bathrooms, I clean the... So I work four hours after show. So I did this for about a year. Then I apply, tried to apply for the academy, they refused. Then I went to a local theater in a small town where I was there for three years. And then finally I got the chance to be accepted when the things start moving and the communists, the wall came down in 88. So they give me the chance, I got in, and I was the first one to graduate the master class academy of five years in one year and three months. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I just had no time to stay in school. I wanted to move. And then that was the time when I start performing in Germany. Actually, I'm proud to say that I MC the famous Kit Kat Club in Berlin for eight months. I personally met Joel Gray there. Um, he came to visit once. Uh, it was extraordinary. And I performed there as the MC. Um, and that's where I became friends with the old school of Marlena Dietrich and all those great guys. I did a lot of cabaret in Berlin for quite a time. And then I got cast for a show and some of you may have heard of the Bulgarian Mystery Voices. I was the bass in that show, singing, and it was a tour to the United States and Canada, and I literally said, this is it. I'm not going back to Bulgaria. So we went to London first, and we did some recordings with Kate Bush <gasps> and Enigma, and then we flew to Canada. We did some shows in Canada at the Edmonton French Festival, where I had the honors to meet Bette Midler and Eric Bogosian. She was doing one of his shows. And then we performed the last show was in Knoxville, Tennessee. At this point, I just decided this is it. And the whole cast went into the airport and we were flying directly from Knoxville, DC. DC, we would not get off the plane just straight to London. So that was my only chance. And I ran from the airport. Violin, backpack, $112 in my pocket, no English at all. No friends, no relatives, nobody. And I was in the streets of Knoxville. And as you know, some of you, good old continent of Europe, where the fountain is, that's the downtown area, right? <laughs> Not in Knoxville. <laughs> so I was in this fountain for three days playing. Nobody gives me money. There's pretty much nobody around. And I slept in a broken building for three days. And then Channel 10 came to do, <coughs> wanted to do an interview with me. I happened to be the first life instrument in the streets of Knoxville. I couldn't speak, so I was afraid even to stop playing. I keep playing, this big guy's like, stop, stop. So he stopped, he started naming countries. He said, German, I speak German. So I said, all right. They brought 20 minutes later, elder lady. She translated, they just wanted to make the news, five minutes, that's it. And a family saw me on TV and sent their son the following day, 19 year old kid, with his friend from University of Tennessee, they spoke German and they want to help me. And basically he says, my mom and dad, we're Christians and we had a big loss in a family a few years back and we think we want to help you and anything you need. The first thing in my head was like, KGB got me, this is it. <laughs> they got me. <laughs> but I had nothing to lose and have adventurous soul and I said, eh, who cares, okay, I'll do it.